if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu. We will try to make sure that they get answered before the end of the webinar. So whenever you're ready, Lionel, you go ahead. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Growing Concerns uh, for September 12th and uh, for this webinar uh, I plan to uh, give a little bit of an update to start off, uh, just a brief update of what's been going on. Uh, harvest is kind of wrapping up with most of the major crops, but uh, so I just want to talk about a few of the things that were left out there. And then I wanted to get into uh, winter wheat. Um, the seeding deadline is coming up and uh, we've been getting several calls from producers regarding seeding of winter wheat and because of some of the conditions that are out there. So I figured maybe I'd go through some of the things that we should be considering uh, before we go out and plant and uh, just some of the, uh, I guess, some of the reasons for and some of the reasons maybe we should be looking at for maybe uh, uh, changing some of our practices. So um, I guess with that, I'm going to start with a little bit of an update. Um, like I mentioned, most of the, the majority of the uh, major crops in, in this in the province pretty much are getting close to being wrapped up. Down here in the southwest uh, we've got uh, basically the uh, you know the odd field of canola that's still out there and uh, then it's going to be the soybeans, corn and sunflowers that are still uh, still out. And uh, the uh, the heat over the past while in the dry conditions I think have maybe going to affect our soybean uh, yields. Uh, they've definitely been drying up really fast here. And uh, I think uh, overall, overall, it's probably going to affect uh, the yield. Uh, it's hard to say yet. Uh, nobody's actually uh, started on any of them. Uh, silage corn has started in the area, and uh, we have an excellent crop of corn uh, in the southwest this year. Uh, conditions were great for good growth, and we've got good good cob development in most fields. So uh, I'm thinking we're going to get, uh, we got lots of really good feed value out there in the corn. Um, you know, some of the guys that are grain, grain uh, taking the corn for grain uh, are fairly happy with what's out there right now and until we get in and start harvesting it, which is going to be a little while yet before it dries down enough uh, to determine what yields are going to be. But uh, it, uh, it looks good so far. Sunflowers, uh, the sunflowers, uh, the crop is small in the southwest this year. There's not a lot of producers that were growing sunflowers, and I guess because of that, uh, um, it's hard to get a real uh, bearing as to how well the crop is doing. Some areas, the crop looks really well, and then you get to other areas, and the crop is a little bit stunted, and maybe just because of lack of moisture, the heads aren't maybe developed as good as they should been should have been. So we're going to see a range there that's going to be kind of all over the board for yields and uh, probably just location and lack of uh, rainfall in some areas have caused that, that issue. But overall, uh, the sunflower crop looks to be at least average. I guess uh, we've been receiving several calls over the past uh, week uh, regarding spring. Um, a lot of producers have uh, finished off some of the, the harvest and uh, got some spare time between now and the next, next crops and they're looking at uh, starting to do some fall spraying here and uh, we're getting uh, producers wondering about the dry conditions as you know are the weeds going to be taking up the chemical is it you know should I be waiting what should we be doing about spraying as we get into the presentation today and I did talking a little bit about the winter wheat I've uh, taken some pictures of some of the weeds that we've been seeing out in the fields and to be surprised actually at the growth of some of the weeds that uh, we're seeing out there so in most of the cases, I've been telling guys to go ahead and spray. The last couple of days, the answer has been easy. We've been getting anywhere from 60 to 70, 70 kilometer winds in the area, so uh, uh, the answer is no. But uh, you know, but with uh, conditions that uh, hopefully are going to improve here, and uh, even though it's dry, the weeds the weeds seem to be uh, coming on, and uh, we're getting uh, actually a fairly good stand of weeds out there. Uh, a lot of the uh, volunteer crops are starting to come now. The, uh, any of the, the seeds that were put over through the harvest situation are growing, and uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of that's starting to come. So, um, 
definitely, uh, uh, I, I think there's the, 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 abil or the ability to go out and get control of some of these harder to kill weeds. One thing I've been throwing at producers when I'm talking to them about spraying uh, is to, to remember the rotation for next year. With, uh, with prices the way they are, um, guys might want to be changing their um, I guess uh, their, their, their crop rotations depending on what crops they want to grow depending on dollar value so I'm uh, just throwing a caution out there with some of them to look at what you sprayed on those fields last year and then if you're looking at topping up some of your glyphosate products uh, this fall just to remember and make, make a note of that so we, uh, we don't run into problems in the spring with residue issues we had a, a few producers that uh, ran into some of those problems this spring, and um, I guess uh, just uh, just a caution because uh, with prices the way they are, uh, you don't want to make uh, mistakes like that that can you know really affect a, a crop the following year. And a lot of times we don't really figure out those situations out until it's it's too late. Uh, the, crops emerged already and showing symptoms and it's uh, we've lost that window for even reseeding at those time periods so uh, I guess just a caution there to to uh, make sure you you know what you've sprayed on those fields in the past and what you're planning on growing on them next year so I guess um, with that uh, I kind of uh, the update is, is short today because there's uh, the crop is uh, starting to become less of the crop out there so I uh, just wanted to cover a few of those issues and then maybe let's get into the whole winter wheat thing here and uh, and uh, get going in the presentation. So winter wheat, um, crop this year that, uh, that did really well. Uh, we uh, producers were wishing we had more acres in. Uh, yields were, uh, were good in the southwest here. Uh, quality was good. And producers are being paid uh, paid well for it, and because of that, we have uh, large uh, large demand for seed this fall. We have lots of producers looking at growing it. We have a lot of first time producers looking at growing it. We have a lot of producers that are looking at expanding their acres uh, with uh, with the change in the marketing system of uh, of the wheat. Uh, producers were able to move their grain around fairly easy so far and uh, they've been uh, uh, really happy with the way the winter wheat has moved. So um, right now we're probably going to see uh, a large increase in acres in the southwest and probably the province. But um, as, uh, as uh, producers get the opportunity to put, put the winter wheat in, if we were to get a rain within the next three to four days here, I could see the acres even increasing. I could see the only problem we'll have is not having enough seed uh, to uh, to get the acres in because I've talked to producers already that are saying it's getting harder and harder to find seed. One of the things we uh, we learned this year too that are uh, some of the producers learned this year is some varieties that definitely do better in in certain conditions in certain areas. So I think uh, producers are definitely uh, looking for varieties that are more suited to their area. So just a few things to, to I guess, consider before you go out and, and start uh, looking at seeding your winter wheat. Or even if you've planted it already and it hasn't come up, you haven't lost, uh, lost this window yet, but go out and control your perennial weeds before the winter wheat is seeded or after it's seeded before the wheat comes up. Winter wheat is a, an excellent crop for competition for most weeds. However, um, when you see some of the pictures that I'll show you shortly here, uh, some of the perennial weeds have gotten to be fairly big already, and if you don't do anything with them this fall, by spring they'll be growing uh, as quick as your winter wheat will be growing, and at that point you'll be busy uh, doing your spring seeding and probably aren't going to be on top of it as we should be, and some of those weeds will get a lot larger by the time you do your in-crop spraying for winter wheat, and at that time period you might be out of luck with uh, some of the products that are available, or any product that's available to control the weeds at those stages. So um, perennial weed control is, is a must uh, for, um, for growing uh, winter cereals. 
here's just an example of a few of the weeds that I've been seeing out in the fields, and it was surprising me to see how how big some of these weeds have gotten. This stubble is probably about six to eight inches high, but you can see that Canada thistle has definitely gotten gotten fairly large already and uh, and is growing actively. You can actually see the all the growth at the center of the of the plant there. So again, getting good growth and also getting good growth of our uh, our volunteer. Uh, this was actually a winter wheat field that I was in. So you know this is uh, winter wheat that's uh, growing already. Just to show you how advanced uh, the the uh, Canada thistle has gotten, you can see the yellow flower starting. So this one is actually starting to flower again. So uh, you know definitely in a stage where if you were to hit it with uh, glyphosate, uh, that uh, you definitely do some. Um, I'd like to say uh, you definitely do some uh, some damage to that, that root system. The other thing you can see, there's definitely a lot more weeds out here, buckwheats out here that's all going to see. Um, you know, there's another picture. Several other weeds in the field, just uh, and uh, it'd be nice just to get uh, get it cleaned up before you go in there and 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 plant your your winter wheat. There's a dandelion that's uh, our salt thistle that's gotten fairly large. So I guess the, the take-home message from there is do a burn off, uh, do a burn off before or after seeding to control the hard to kill weeds. Uh, in some cases, you may need to spray in crop to control the weeds before winter. That's happened sometimes where uh, we've had a wide open fall and we've had uh, um, if you've gone in and sprayed your burn off and then um, later on we've gotten some good growing conditions in the crop. Um, you know, a good example would have been last year. Uh, we had some really good growth in a lot of areas, and we were seeing a lot of the uh, the uh, perennials or winter annuals starting to to germinate and and grow again. And uh, we were seeing a lot of guys with uh, cleaver issues, a lot of guys with thistle issues. So some of the guys actually did go out and and uh, and spray in crop uh, with you know nothing major, but uh, you know a buck troll or a, um, you know, curtail or something just to get control of some of those weeds so they don't get a foothold in the crop for, for next fall or next spring. So uh, again, once you're, you're done, you're burn off, um, I guess the, the big thing is, is to keep monitoring those fields. Uh, right now it doesn't look like they're going to do much because we're in a dry situation, but uh, if we do get some rain, uh, the soil is still warm, those plants are going to grow fast. So before you go out and seed, um, seed treatment to ensure the establishment of healthy stands and the control of smut. We uh, actually had uh, a fair bit of that this year in, in, in wheat and barley. And uh, a lot of producers, uh, <clears throat> especially I guess as the season got a little bit later here, or later in the spring, weren't treating their, their uh, the spring cereals. And we were seeing a lot of smut in a lot of crops. and um, I guess uh, one of the things that I would consider um, right now with growing winter wheat, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is that uh, the uh, winter wheat uh, may may have to sit in the ground for a fair period of time before it germinates, just because of the dry conditions right now. And because of that, it might not hurt to have that seed treated just so it be able to stay healthier in the soil, stay. Uh, uh, in condition where when we do get the rain it can start uh, growing, uh, it's uh, better to uh, be on the safe side there than putting seed in the ground and, and not having it treated and then running into problems a little bit later on. The other thing I would say with that is uh, uh, when you're going to be seeding, uh, I would definitely be in these conditions where it's a little bit drier, is definitely keeping my seeding rate up, uh, making sure that there's good germination in the seed, and you know, looking at uh, you know two bushels an acre for for seed for seeding. Next comment I made there was seed uh, recommended varieties, and um, there are several new varieties that are out there. I've been talking to some producers, and they've been throwing out some uh, some variety names that I haven't even heard of yet. Uh, so I have to do some checking up myself. Uh, so there are several new varieties. So do your homework. 
make sure you're growing a variety that you're going to be comfortable with growing. I know there's a lot of producers this year that uh, wanted to go for, uh, I guess last fall, wanted to go for high yields. There was some some winter wheat fields, uh, uh, some varieties that yielded in that 90 to 100 bushel an acre uh, a year ago. So they were off to try to plant those varieties. And then this, this year I found out that some of those varieties tend to lodge very easy. Uh, makes it uh, a lot more difficult for harvest and uh, a lot more difficult for disease control. So uh, make sure the variety you're growing is going to be fitted to your operation. Uh, uh, something that lodges or grows you know, five to six feet tall and lodges and then you have to swath or uh, it really slows down the, the straight cutting process may not be something that you're wanting to do. So uh, make sure you look at varieties that are going to suit your program. There are, Excuse, oh, um, sorry, Lionel. I, I do have a question here. Okay. Um, how much fall growth do you need with winter wheat to survive the winter? To, is it too dry to germinate right now, and are you waiting for rain? Okay. Uh, I'll probably answer those a little bit farther on, but maybe I'll deal with it right now. Um, with the... Um, uh, with the winter wheat uh, for um, the first part of that question was how much growth do you need and um, really uh, as long as uh, the optimum is having it in the two to three lease stage when it goes into winter and this way you know for sure you're going to have the, a good crown development and you're going to be able to go into uh, winter in, in good condition. Um, you know uh, as it gets into that four and five lease stage we even get better crown development. Uh, last year we had some fields that were, you know, um, five and six leaf stage, and at that point they might have been losing something because they were actually using too much of their nutrients, uh, and maybe uh, they were a little bit more affected by the by the winter. With the dry conditions, the big concern right now is uh, is it going to germinate? And um, I've seen uh, winter wheat crops that have germinated below the soil surface and never did emerge. So when you dug them up in the fall or after, you know, three weeks after the guy planted it and we were out looking in the field as to what's going on and we're finding winter wheat seed that has actually germinated, there was a little sprout in a root system developing on it, developing on it. Those plants made it. They, uh, they grew in the spring and uh, the only thing that, uh, the problem you run into there is that uh, the, you have delayed maturity. So those crops are usually no farther ahead than sowing a spring wheat crop uh, in the next, next spring. So basically you're, you're, that crop is starting the same as you would be planting in May of next year. So you really don't have any advantage of the, uh, the early maturity and the spreading out your harvest uh, also, you you do lose your um, your weed control uh, because it's not going to be as competitive earlier on. So, in a lot of those cases, uh, you land up having to spray a wild oat herbicide. So, you know you you don't uh, as long as it germinates. Uh, I, you know I'm I'm fairly confident that it's going to make a, a winter wheat crop. Uh, the only problem is you delay your maturity you increase your costs and you probably reduce your yield because you're more susceptible to diphtheriums in the fall and the other diseases that you're uh, that you hope to kind of avoid by uh, by having an early crop in. So hopefully that answered that question and uh, uh, I'm probably going to cover that again as we go uh, through the presentation. So again just to comment again, just a closing comment on the varieties. Uh, definitely do your homework. Um, I know there's several producers that are looking at some of the different varieties. Uh, your location is important. I know in the southwest here a lot of producers do not like the semi-dwarf varieties as much because we sometimes run into the problems with having to spray a wild oat herbicide. So that's why we maybe run into some of the problems with the lodging. So. Again, just make sure you know the variety you're growing and make sure it fits your operation. Seed place fertilizer, I guess that's the next thing that we were starting to get quite a few questions about regarding winter wheat and planting. 
winter wheat that uh, in conditions that we have right now. Um, under normal conditions, uh, a lot of producers have gone to um, a one-pass type of system for planting their winter wheat. They're going out, uh, putting all their fertilizer down uh, as they're seeding. The equipment uh, allows uh, good separation from fertilizer and seed, and uh, producers have been fairly fortunate uh, uh, with being able to uh, make this system work, so it definitely eliminates some of the work that needs to be done in the spring for additional nitrogen application. Uh, producers are using the uh, ESN fertilizers, which also helps in uh, limiting some of the losses of nitrogen, so uh, that system has been working fairly well. I guess one caution, I guess, with the year like uh, this fall is that uh, under the dry conditions that we have, um, and the seed is, has the potential for being or sitting in the ground for a long period of time, uh, we may want to rethink the rates of nitrogen we're putting down uh, in the fall. And I guess the reason I say that is nit most fertilizers have salts on them. And uh, if the seed is going to sit a long time in the ground, uh, eventually some of those salts will, will migrate to the uh, seed and we may affect some of the germination of the seed. It may not be an issue, but I guess it's something that um, I would just, uh, I, a word of caution, I guess, uh, just so we don't run into that problem. Uh, I guess there would be no, no uh, uh, we've done it in the past where we've got to go back in the spring and top up our nitrogen, so maybe this is something we could be thinking about uh, as we're, uh, you know, looking at some of these, some of these dry fields, or if we're looking at sowing a few more acres, and uh, and are starting to get concerned about the dry conditions. Just a few more things, um, and some of these points, like I said, I might have touched on a bit. Uh, seed winter wheat, uh, late August to early September, um, just a. Uh, uh, emphasize the point that the deadline for full mass uh, coverage is September the 15th and um, so you'd want to have it in by uh, I guess we've got three or four days here I guess before the before the deadline or before you start uh, losing your full coverage. I mentioned a little bit before about the uh, staging and uh, winter wheat plants should be well established approximately the three leaf stage before freeze up once they get into the three, four leaf stage, they developed a, a good crown, and that, that's how they'll survive the winter. So that's uh, that's what you're you're aiming for. However, I like I mentioned, uh, we have seen it where uh, it uh, they have survived through the winter. Seeding shallow. But I'm getting a few uh, quite a few calls here on that as well. Or quite a few questions on that when we're talking winter week. You know, should I be putting it deeper? I guess it all depends on how deep you have to go. You know, I don't mind sowing an inch. Uh, you know, uh, if guys are to start talking, you know, we're just start putting it down two inches to put it into moisture. Really, with the conditions we have, uh, if you put it down to two inches, it's probably going to dry fairly quickly down to those two-inch layer as you're disturbing the soil. So, you know, I would say that you're not going to gain a whole bunch by doing that. I would prefer you have it sown shallow and let's wait for the rain and uh, then once it rains it'll be up a lot faster and then you won't have to worry about any any situations about uh, depth or sowing too deep. Seeding rate, I did mention this and uh, two bushels an acre is is uh, a good goal to hit. Um, if you uh, if you don't have a, a good thick winter wheat stand you do have run into a potential problem of having a thinner stand and thinner stands uh, usually run into problems with uh, weed competition and uh, then you usually run into yield problems there with lower yields. The other thing with the thicker stand is you do um, reduce a little bit the amount of tillers on some of the winter wheat plants and that's you may think that's a bad thing, but it's almost a good thing because a lot of times some of those tillers are really small heads and develop late. And uh, you know, in some years, those are the ones that cause us problems at harvest because they stay green longer, as well as those are the ones that may be more prone to uh, 
fusarium because uh, we have a wider window of when fusarium can affect the plants. So a, a, a heavier seeding rate reduces tillers, you have more main stems, and then you have it maturing more at a more uh, even, even stage. I was out in this field yesterday and uh, uh, was a guy that was sowing winter wheat yesterday and uh, we were looking at the at the stubble. Uh, this is along the headland so um, it was into a real nice canola stand. Uh, no problem going in. Um, when a guy phones and asks me if you know we should be seeding, uh, one of the first questions I ask him is when you're seeding are you uh, bringing up lumps or is it seeding? And, and putting it into a nice seed bed and uh, if it's seeding good and not bring it up lumps and putting it into a nice seed bed then uh, I still think we should be going ahead. Just a little bit of a close-up of the seed. This is where about the depth of the seed he was putting it in. You can actually see that there was a little bit of moisture. Now I know I was on the headland there when we were looking but still you know he was getting it you know about that three-quarters of an inch down a little bit of lumping, but no major lumps in the soil, and the seed was, uh, you know, definitely in, in the right spot for, ready for the rain to, to get going. So, I guess uh, uh, making a good job seeding. So, I guess I would say to keep going. Been getting a few calls um, and uh, kind of a kind of question some of them, but I got a couple guys I was thinking we'd have lots of canola stubble to uh, to sow winter wheat on and uh, I did get a few calls regarding uh, you know sowing into uh, a wheat or a barley stand and really sowing winter wheat into uh, wheat or barley stands is not overly recommended just because of the lot of issues especially the, the wheat streak mosaic is a thing we need to be worried about and uh, and when you look at this this stand here, uh, you can see the volunteer crop growing. So if uh, if there was an issue, that's um, these green plants. That's what the mite would be living on right now. And uh, so if the mite is in the field, it'd be living on these green plants right now. So if you were to go in and plant winter wheat into those uh, those uh, this stand, uh, you could definitely run into issues with. Uh, uh, next spring when the uh, winter wheat's growing, the mite would just jump over onto the winter wheat plants and then you could uh, and infect those plants. So I guess uh, uh, definitely a concern there. Now if it's uh, something that you absolutely have to do, uh, we, it's called a, a bridge or a, and a time period be between these plants being, these green plants being dead and your new plants emerging. And usually they're asking for 14 days, uh, 10 to 14 days, where the green there's no green in the field. So you'd need to go out and spray this, uh, get a good kill, and then come back and uh, and sow your winter wheat. So if you're looking at that situation right now, um, you're probably in a situation where you wouldn't be able to do it and still be insurable through uh, through uh, crop insurance. Just a couple of pictures of what wheat streak mosaic will do to a crop. This is um, a winter wheat crop uh, that was sown uh, actually after a canola field. They didn't get good control of um, the burn with the burn off. Uh, they thought the the, the, uh, the canola stubble was really clean. Didn't see much uh, much issue out there, so they didn't spray. Uh, went out in the spring and there was yellowing in the field. Uh, several patches throughout uh, throughout the whole half section, and when you got a look at closer look at the leaves, you could see the streaking up and down the leaves. So definitely an issue of wheat streak mosaic, and it just moved over from living on uh, on uh, volunteer cereals and what it was with uh, the crop rotation in this instance was winter wheat, then canola and then hard red spring wheat and in the canola crop they didn't get good control of the winter the volunteer winter wheat and uh, that's why we ran into that problem so um, I guess uh, another reason why the burn off is important and another reason why sowing on cereal stubble 
uh, is really not a, a good practice. This field was worked, uh, but I had one producer that was looking at sowing uh, winter wheat on pea stubble. Um, you know, the, cons the concern there is there's no straw to catch snow for uh, for winter survival. So if we get poor poor conditions during the winter time, so if we get very little snow, you have no snow catch with fields like this. Uh, they tend to uh, blow off, uh, or it just uh, uh, melts off fast and you have bare fields and you have, leave that crown exposed to the cold conditions throughout the grow of winter season and you have greater potential of, of winter kill. So really not a, a recommended practice but you know um, it has worked and uh, I think the way um, crop insurance works on this one and you would probably just need to just check with your agent but uh, the way it works is if uh, if you plant it into a stand like this that you wouldn't be insured until it gets, gets growing in the spring and is uh, a crop in the spring and it probably we would be need to be checked in the spring so um, we had several fields from uh, after the after the flood from last year that uh, we had several fields that were sown to winter wheat this in this kind of condition and and they turned out okay but we also had uh, a lot of good growth last fall, so a lot of the winter wheat was actually catching snow for itself. So um, I guess uh, you know a year like this year where we may not get that type of growth because we're needing the rain, uh, you may be running into more of a, a winter kill issue. So uh, I guess just a caution there if you're looking at sowing winter wheat on um, on land that's. Uh, you know, not going to be able to catch any snow. So I guess um, with that, I think I've covered quite a few of the reasons why our uh, what's been going on right now with the winter wheat, and uh, I um, just wanted to go over there's like the, the top ten reasons why you want to grow winter wheat in Manitoba, and I figured I'd just go through those ones with uh, with everybody just to. Uh, uh, you know, kind of, kind of just go through the reasons why, and then maybe I might throw in a few, uh, you know, uh, added comments. But it's a good fit for conservation farming systems. And uh, when you look at a lot of our producers now, we have a lot of uh, minimum slash zero till drills out there. So a lot of the a lot of the equipment we have out there uh, is has the ability to to plant winter wheat, and with uh, you know with the uh, size of the farms. Uh, it's a good way to uh, spread out your workload, so it's definitely got a good fit with uh, with our way we're farming right now. Uh, more efficient uh, water utilization than spring seeded crops, and uh, if uh, if you're concerned that we might not get much snow or we may be heading into a dry spell, uh, when you look at winter wheat, uh, once it gets established, uh, if you have it in good uh, uh, like a good uh, canola stubble that's able to catch snow through the winter time, it'll be able to use that moisture and get going early in the spring. And uh, we've probably seen that a bit this year with some of the crops because it seemed to get hot and dry with some of our spring seeded crops and really affect some of our yields. And uh, so uh, winter wheat was able to. Um, you know, it was had grown through and was developing seed before things started to dry up. If you're in an area where wheat midge is a concern, um, winter wheat, you know, depending on what time the midge is going to be around, but you know, usually winter wheat is ones that can avoid uh, is uh, is past the stage before wheat midge is uh, is going to be around to do the damage. So uh, uh, because of the early heading, so you can save yourself some money there with insecticides. It's a good weed competitor, so uh, you know 90% of the time there's no need for wild oat control. Uh, saves you anywhere from 15 to 20 dollars an acre on input costs. So, uh, but again, remember that uh, to to pick the variety that's going to be suited for your area, because uh, again, you know if you uh, if you got a variety that's not going to work well on your operation. Uh, you may end up having to spend this extra fifteen to twenty dollars, or you may you may not. So, 
just make sure your the variety you're choosing is going to be suited for that. Um, no spraying for wild oat reduces selection pressure for herbicide resistance and it gives you the ability to use different products on your farm so you're not always spraying wild oats on that field. So it gives the field a break from, from not having uh, a product out there selecting for uh, certain wild oat uh, plants. So that gives you, you know, the longer time period for not building up resistance. Fusarium. Fusarium is a big thing and uh, we see it every year. We're seeing it again this year in some of the wheat. We're seeing it in some of the barley, and uh, by planting uh, winter wheat, you uh, you avoid uh, our. I guess depending on when the, the conditions if conditions are right, but usually that you reduce the risk anyways for fusarium on on those plants. One of the things you do have to remember with winter wheat is fungicide application for disease is pretty much a a, a must. So even though we're saying you're going to reduce the risk, you're still spraying for fusarium, you're still spraying for tan spot, you're still spraying for rust. So your fungicide program is definitely important. This one uh, avoids seeding problems on late wet springs. Uh, you know, that's something that a lot of producers took advantage of this year because they picked a lot of their wet fields that uh, were at, they were having problems planting over the last couple of years and planted them to winter wheat and it definitely uh, paid benefits there because those fields were able to produce really good winter wheat crops this year and uh, and get crops on them and get them back into growing uh, crops instead of growing weeds. So uh, if you've got fields that are consistently wet fields, uh, it definitely is a, a, a good fit for that. You reduce the amount of fuel and pesticides you use. Uh, less disturbance to wildlife, especially for waterfalls. So that's why DU is is always happy when uh, they see a lot of winter wheat acres going in. And we got high yield potential, and uh, for hopefully less inputs. And uh, and we're seeing that this year with uh, high yield, good price, and uh, you know not as much inputs as our cereal crops, our spring seeded cereal crops. So uh, therefore, we uh, we get uh, hopefully a higher return per acre. So some of the concerns that uh, we're looking at this year, and I guess the biggest one, and I've talked about it uh, when we had the question that came through, but uh, lack of moisture and will it germinate? And uh, right now, the seed is probably going to sit in the ground for a fair period of time until we get some moisture. So. I guess uh, if you're seeding a lot of acres, does that mean you keep on seeding? Uh, maybe you cut back some just because you're you're concerned that it's not all gonna uh, can germinate this fall and uh, and get into that stage, that three to four leaf state that you want it to be in. If it doesn't germinate, you're really no not a whole bunch. Like it germinates below ground, but does not uh, does not. Uh, develop to the three, four leaf stage, you're probably not going to be very far ahead than you would with your spring seeded crop. Uh, the only thing you will take advantage of is uh, is the uh, uh, winter uh, snowfall and spring early spring moisture. A lot of calls regarding poor weed growth and what should you be doing with them if you're wanting to go uh, sow winter wheat. Um, you spray. Uh, you go out there and you spray. You either do it before seeding or you do it after seeding, but you spray because if you don't spray, you're going to run into ish issues later on. Uh, just like uh, the pictures I showed earlier on in the pres presentation, um, the weeds are out there and they are growing. And it may not look like they're growing as fast as they should, but they still are and they're still developing. And um, with uh, with the cost of uh, one pass of uh, of, uh, of herbicide, uh, it's definitely going to be worth your while. And I guess the last point is what variety to grow. And um, I guess with that, I would say make sure you do your homework and know what variety you want to grow because it can definitely mean uh, uh, more cost or less cost to you depending on uh, on the year. And uh, so uh, whether it's more cost in in herbicide or more cost in the length of time it takes you to harvest a field, 
and if you're not getting any extra bushels, it's just more more straw to put through the machine, then that's definitely something you should be looking at. And I think with that, uh, that pretty much covers my uh, um, talk on winter wheat. And um, I guess, Linda, is there any questions? Not at this time, Lionel. Okay. Well, I guess with that, uh, there is a couple more things I wanted to mention. One is that um, for next uh, week's webinar, um, planning on doing a uh, kind of a wrap up of the whole year, and uh, it's going to be the uh, I guess the last webinar of the of the growing concern season. So. Um, um, I guess that will be for next week, and uh, I guess with that, uh, if there are no questions, that will end the webinar for today.